Hi everyone, and welcome back. Today is Privacy Day on the Towards Data Science podcast, and that's because we're gonna be talking to Eliano Marquez, who's had really a whole career focused on AI privacy and data security. Now, Eliano is currently the Executive VP of Data and AI at Protegrity, and so today we're gonna be talking about the philosophy of privacy, whether targeted ads are really all that bad, and how hacks and data breaches have evolved in the last decade. Now, I think one of the biggest take homes from this conversation is just how poorly privacy is understood, not only by non-technical people, but also by developers and data scientists in the data and AI communities themselves. We clearly have a long way to go to make a meaningful fraction of people privacy literate, but hopefully conversations like this one can inch that ball forward just a bit. With that said, I hope you enjoyed the conversation and I'll step out of the way and let it begin. Well, uh, hi, Eliano. Thanks so much for joining me for the podcast. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's a great set of topics we're going to discuss today. Yeah, I'm really excited about this too. I, I think this is really an area that it's easy to lose sight of when you're, you know, when you're thinking a lot about like risks from AI and like what does this mean for the future of humanity? Like, what does it mean for the future of privacy? That's really what we're going to be tackling today. And uh, you've obviously done a ton of work in this area. So today we're going to be doing a big, yeah, grand tour of privacy. And I think a, a good place to start here would just be why you got into this space in the first place. What was it about privacy that like drew you to it? Why is this like the pressing issue that you think needs to be addressed today? Yeah, well, um, I think that's, that's a great question. I go back to probably building the first set of algorithms uh, in my professional career, maybe somewhere around 2008 or nine, still in academia. And in 2010, seeing some of the power of those algorithms uh, back then in Portugal um, and seeing them in action and what they could do to, you know, help uh, the decision making and help uh, the, the, the society to identify uh, many benefits. And as, as the world progressed, you found yourself working with different organizations around the world, which was my case, building multiple and, you know, systems uh, to improve processes, rather, you know, improve costs, reduce uh, uh, costs, optimize processes, incre increase revenue. And, and you really found yourself um, tackling multiple times the same challenges around, number one, data availability, data uh, access, constraints about confidential data being held uh, in silos. Um, and as the world progressed more towards the last five years of, of, the, of the previous decade, um, you found an emerging awareness uh, around the privacy of the individuals, primarily coming from the digital footprint that we all leave behind when we are accessing all our devices in any shape or form and the increasing constraints and the increasing uh, challenges around breaches of data, uh, which at the end of the day, you know, contributes even further for less access to data for good causes um, and puts everything that we're doing in the world in terms of intelligence in question. So I found myself in a position to basically say, well, we're, we're not gonna stop being more intelligent. It just doesn't work like that. We, we won't stop having digital uh, solutions. We won't stop having more AI and, and AI for, for better causes. What we're really missing is making the world more aware of the privacy techniques, the privacy technologies, and therefore the additional layers of security that we can bring to the table to enable uh, the societies to kind of move on with uh, their implementations of digital transformations, implementations of AI without compromising on the privacy of their customers or employees, uh, and therefore the privacy of society and therefore the privacy of our children and our you know, generations to come. I do think we're fighting against awareness 
more uh, than anything else. And awareness, not just on the non-technical uh, regulatory politicians kind of space, but also on the technical folks. Oh, interesting. Which for me is, is, is what makes my move to trying to address these challenges and realize that the awareness is really uh, the big obstacle that we need to overcome. Of course, technologies are evolving and we can talk a little bit about that. And of course, more techniques will come, but I, I, I want to I just share a big outcome of my journey into this space is any organization in the world, any, will have a data privacy strategy, but won't have a data privacy strategy in isolation from the chief data officer and the chief security officer. It, it, it actually needs to be put together as a triangle capability between the definition of what privacy it is for you, what actually that translates into two from a security standpoint, right? what algorithms, cryptographic techniques that are going to be applied, but also, and more importantly, how is that being consumed and used by the people that work with data on a very you know, regular basis, which is the entire organization, but very likely under the capabilities being put together by the chief digital and data officer. And that triangle of capabilities, awareness, uh, is where the world is behind. Mm. And as a result, we're all acting nervously and panicking uh, to the regulations that are coming, like GDPR, yeah. California Data Act, and so on and so forth, which is a way to do it. You know, if I tell you I'm going to hammer you um, in your head, would you run away? Of course you will. But is that the way for me to make you more conscious about the problem? Probably not. I find this really fascinating because of the strength of the overlap between the theme. So we, we've talked a lot about AI safety on the podcast. We've talked a lot about AI ethics, a responsible use of AI, all, all this sort of thing. There's so much consistency here, even with AI privacy. First off, it really seems like a lot of the harm, a lot of the risk is hidden. So like, like you said, you were listing a bunch of the reasons why, you know, AI, AI privacy is important at first. And one of the things you mentioned was, hey, we need this so that people keep being willing to offer their data so that we can keep using it for really important good causes. That's not going to continue if people lose faith in the integrity of the data security and data privacy side of, of what companies are doing. That's not an obvious risk. That's very much an externality. It's hidden from you when you just... You know, you're bright eyed and bushy tailed. You start a startup. You're like, I'm going to change the world. But whoa, whoa, like, you know, the way you manage and navigate your data, uh, you, you risk becoming the next Cambridge Analytica if you're not careful. And, and that has a cost to everybody, including data for good efforts, that sort of thing. Technical people don't know enough about data privacy and, and neither do non-technical people. So what is it generally that technical people are missing? I'm really curious about this. Like, what are the things that developers don't tend to think of when they just code up that random forest or they code up that neural network? What are the, the things you would want them to know? First of all, first of all, starting with the basics foundation, you know, I don't know if this is true or not, but I don't know if 10% of the world uh, is already protecting their data as they should. Yeah. And I'm not telling anything because that's virtually, I'm, I'm, I'm in no way, shape or form a sales individual uh, in, in, in regards of a commercial you know, relationship. That, that's not what I'm saying, but we all as a society need our data protected, full stop. We need to stop the data breaches uh, phenomenon, if you will, um, because that affects our lives in ways we can't control. And that starts with organizations having a clear awareness and especially the technical teams that are looking into how to protect databases, data warehouses, uh, lake houses, data lakes, on-premise, on-cloud, as data is being moved, that needs to just be there. And yeah. no data science or engineer should be having access to data that is not protected in first place. 
Can you tell me a little bit about the, the history of these things and like, how are we seeing this change? What are the threats to privacy that are changing or how are they changing over time? Is it is it like still still the same kinds of breaches that we're seeing today that we were seeing in like 2008? Or is the, the nature of the information that's being leaked or the way in which it's being leaked changing? Well, so I think all of that is happening. So I think the, the, the people that are trying to do harm with data they are way more sophisticated than they were in the past. Um, and, uh, you know, there are estimations, and, and this one that I'm quoting uh, is, is coming from, from a Gartner report, that uh, by as early as next year, 30% uh, of the attacks uh, on the digital uh, space will be against AI systems, both poisoning the training data uh, or adding uh, layers to the models on when they're making their decisions through different techniques that you know doesn't matter uh, the, the particular techniques as, as we speak. So, so I think answering your question, it's evolving, and especially on how the attacks are being conducted. You know, maybe very late in in the past they were stealing uh, you know a, a particular database and that's the data they had. Now they will become smarter and smarter to know, hey, there is a service on a cloud that has a machine learning model being served to make decisions. And, and this model, by the way, retrains every day. You know, what happens if we poison the training data? How would they do that, by the way? Like, how, I'm really curious about this, sorry. It just sounds so, so cool. <laughs> Imagine you have a data set about um, you uh, being eligible for a loan within a particular uh, financial institution, a fintech or, or a more traditional bank. And that model contains information about, you know, your expected income, the last, you know, the number of transactions you did on a credit card, you know, some information about, you know, your ins and outs uh, of, of, of the data that we have. And in some geographies, uh, especially the more developed ones, you can connect, you know, you can purchase data about your utilities and telcos, so you can know, you know, how, if you missed an invoice and all, all those sorts of things, right? So imagine uh, you have a machine learning solution in a cloud that uh, basically receives updated data every week and retrains an algorithm every week, and then that is part of the decision of a process. So you will go online and ask for uh, a loan for a particular, you know, you're purchasing uh, a, a, a computer, you might be a student and basically you get a no. And so, well, I mean, I'm, you know, never, you know, I have the capacity, this should be fine. And you have no explanation. And what, what might just happen is you got an attack in that process that was pushing the new data to the place where the algorithm will retrain and basically they uh, added rows into that training data of things that just doesn't make sense and will you know mix the optimization process of that algorithm so imagine a retraining process with 10 million customers two of those 10 million now are completely poisoned right right so of course organizations can protect themselves with the right you know security this is this is already thinking that all of those things went wrong yeah and somebody knew what they're doing. The other one that can happen as well is when the algorithm is being used in production where you're essentially, you're online and you're making a request to that service, which says, you know, your age and a bunch of other details, and then the algorithm will give an answer, which then is incorporated into a business process. In that process of getting the data and giving the answer, you could be poisoning stuff there as well, which will change the answer that that algorithm is particularly doing. So those kinds of things will happen more often than people think, which will bring, of course, uh, way more controls and governance into uh, into the into this particular AI. But to be honest, this will be true with AI or any other digital process that exists right. out there. Um, so it's not specific just for this, but. Um, you know, you, you asked me 2018 to now, this is the type of sophistication that you will see. So, so this, this will happen more and more and more. And as a result, data privacy and security, especially in the context of AI, already joined forces yeah, and yeah. their hands together. Because there is no other way to, number one, continue to evolve at least 
and the good part of AI into the future where more techniques and solutions will become available. But more importantly, uh, we, will, we still have a lot of processes around the world with standard and traditional AI that is, are not in production uh, for a variety of reasons that need to reach production so that we improve processes and et cetera, and we take inefficiencies out of, of the world that we don't need to. And some of them could be, um, you know, food wastage. Yeah. I'm not, you know, I'm not always talking about a business making a profit. I'm talking about some big societal issues that, that we, we sometimes don't connect the dots. Um, and, and in order for us to do that, we need to bring privacy and security into the mix. No yeah. question about that. There are a couple of different continuums that I that, that you're making me realize are really continuums. Like you know, you used to th think of like security and privacy as separate things. There's a continuum between those two, and now they're as you say they're mixed. But also like from algorithms to data. Like it used to be that we would think of privacy as, as meaning like okay, your data is private. Nobody's going to steal it. But now, I mean, it's kind of like if you can access the algorithm, you there are a variety of different attacks. And I'm sure we'll talk about some where you actually can look into the algorithm and of course tease out like individual users data in some cases to the extent that the algorithm like overfits and essentially memorizes different users profiles uh, one thing this brings to mind is uh, i remember i was we we're talking about this just before we started recording but back in like 2008 when i joined facebook out of uh, out of high school um i you know i handed over a whole bunch of photos there were photos from my graduation other photos that um, i i would have taken down since then because they were embarrassing but anyway i gave these things to facebook and at the time, there was no such thing as computer vision, no such thing as conned nets. We were still four years away from AlexNet being a thing. And so I gave those photos away with the understanding that Facebook could only even theoretically use them for a very limited set of purposes. But fast forward to now, and now that same data that I gave them then with a certain level of understanding, a certain expectation of the use cases it could be put to, all of a sudden now it's a treasure trove of, of value. Like you can pull out so much more value, value that if I had known about it back then, I never would have um, sent over to Facebook. So I, I wonder if there's a story here as well that has to do with like technological change, algorithmic improvement, and like whether people factor that in in their assessment of like their privacy needs. You know, I give Google some data today, maybe they can't use it for too much right now, but what is the utility of that into the future? Like, is this something that co companies should or do have processes for? Like, do, do people tend to be aware of this and like kind of revisit the original purposes that people gave them the data for? No, no one knew what they would do with your data in 2008 and eight or nine. And quite frankly, no one knows what we're gonna do with all this data that we already have collected. We just know part of this data will be utilized to improve our life and society. And part, unfortunately, like anything else in life, will also contribute to some problems. And the same way, electric cars will probably do a lot of good to our society. We don't even know what it will do. And some part of it will actually contribute to a worse part of, of what we do. And we have to be conscious of that in any aspect of our life. Now, what can we do regarding to data to improve it? Well, there's a certain amount of things that you know, companies uh, like Apple uh, uh, will do. And you know, there are some comments in, in, over the internet that Google with the federated learning cohort strategy for the cookies, you know, that's just another way of doing it. I, I actually don't think that way. I actually think that Apple and both Google are actually listening to some of these concerns. On the Apple side, you know, a big, you know, at least in paper, um, a, a good privacy, you know, commander uh, have really put tools out there to help us have more transparency and awareness of what each app and which particular, um, uh, in, on their devices at least, which app does what and what do you want to offer to you know, uh, overcome those and you, you shouldn't just get the data from A to B and to C. Uh, on the other hand, I, I actually like what Google put out and I'm, I'm, I'm not you know, defending Google or being against it. I'm just saying, I think it's a step forward to stop the, the cookies, uh, the third party cookies and to have you know, key anonymity, because key anonymity is indeed a privacy technique. We need to, you know, have assurance from Google that they are doing those. 
do, do you mind elaborating there on, on uh, key anonymity? I'm not sure if I, uh, actually, I'm sure I don't know it. <laughs> so basically what, what Google uh, released is that you will get um, a segment. So it's a, you look at it as you will be part of a segment and then that segment will uh, uh, store your weekly browser key uh, statistics and refresh that every week. And then basically what the advertisers will be able to do is advertise against that segment and not against you as we do today. Now, people are just saying, oh, but you'll be part of a segment with another thousand people that look exactly like you. And, and you know, you will, you will be able to still get personalized ads. And, and yes, personal, personalized ads can be absolutely um, boring, and, you know, you don't, but at the same time, you want some level of personalization. Yeah, 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 right? I, I totally you agree. Know, I we can have both worlds and people say, oh, they are monitoring. Well, yes and no, there is a particular aspect of that that actually is a good thing. And if yeah. Google is now putting us in segments and actually introducing privacy because key anonymity, which is basically assuring that you are part of a group that have similar characteristics, they're going to do that with the same hash algorithm or using federated learning, basically training an algorithm in the edge to basically then uh, create those characteristics and those cohorts assuring key anonymity and they're going to assure key anonymity meaning there are certain amount of people hidden in a crowd by a central server that will calculate how many people are in every particular cohort and if that doesn't meet the minimum that they define they will essentially group you up to another segment i think we should be saying that's positive yeah that positive. no is that the perfect solution I, i'm not sure probably we need to evolve it but it's a massive step forward in, in that direction. You know, we, and, and in, in Protegrity, one of the things we offer is anonymization of data with key anonymity. And there are techniques for you to monitor and measure that. GDPR says, if you anonymize the data, the data, as long as it cannot be tied up to an individual, you know, it's no longer bounded by GDPR. So there are good things happening in the world that I believe we should call out but the world is not perfect. And therefore, these solutions may not also be perfect. I think most people who have thought enough about privacy to be worried about it often haven't thought enough about the, it was gonna sound weird and maybe controversial, but the benefits of targeted advertisement. I mean, like, like we're, you're gonna see ads one way or the other. Like, like Facebook, Twitter, Google, these companies offer valuable services. Uh, let's say Google in particular, because I don't think anyone will debate the value of search. Um, this is an incredibly valuable service. It's funded by ads. You're going to see ads. The only remaining question is how targeted, how relevant do you want those ads to be? And in an ideal world, like there, there are, of course, ways in which this gets abused. There's no question. It can go too far. No question. But um, you're, the, it seems to me like the best case scenario in the ideal world, an ad is actually just like something that is instrumentally useful to you. You literally see something that you're looking for. And that's great. Great, I, I agree one hundred percent. And look, maybe as as Apple is doing by, you know, you are in control of what data gets shared and what data, you know, you can see. I think the world will evolve for more awareness tools. But by the way, this goes back to the awareness. This is awareness on the non technical stuff. Yeah, a large proportion of the world don't have the technical understanding and the skills but they are just afraid. Oh my God, I just clicked in that website and now I'm on this one and this is an ad. Like somebody's watching me, my phone and they just throw the phone away. Oh, they're, they're listening. And, you know, I, I get that, right? I'm concerned about my children and my, we all are. We have to do something. But I think we have to create tools to give people more decisions, but there needs to be consequences and inevitably about, about those, those decisions. So let me just put this scenario out as part of the, the example. So let's say you, Google gives you the choice. You know, if you, you could be part of cohorts that update your browser history or weekly, or you might decide to actually um, uh, be part of a cohort that updates monthly or every quarter, which means, you know, what you do today wouldn't show up as an ad. And maybe you will be less afraid about, about that. But yeah. then Google says, and there's a consequence, because by the way, everything I do for you is free. You know, search, you don't pay for a search, it's a browser. But when you are searching for stuff, 
or when you are utilizing, well, then maybe if you choose that, Gmail is no longer free. You have to no. pay $2 a month. You say, hold on a minute. Now I have to pay Gmail? Or let's go to the Facebook example. Facebook may say, okay, now I'm controlled by Apple. And Apple says, by default, no data will be tracked by Facebook. And once the user goes there and says, I allow it. What, happened? what will Facebook do? Simple. They're going to break down their platform into features. They say, oh, you want to post a photo? Go there and enable that stuff. Yeah. You say, well, no, I don't want you to do that. Well, then there is a subscription. Now everyone in Facebook will pay a dollar a month. And that's how they're going to make money. And therefore, they're going to be able to have the platform up and running. And I think this consciousness about everything is free, it's not. There is, there is cost to run platforms, teams, and people. Of course, they're profitable, and I'm, I don't want to you know, give the, the you know, but, but people have to be conscious that the reason why all of this stuff is free is because they are giving their data away at, at the cost of that. And if they don't want that working model, let's build social media platforms that people pay for it. And therefore, none of that is there or a search engine or a Gmail, you know, and, and, th and then we should have um, a way more controlled environment. Like for example, when you pay for your telecom, uh, for your TV at home, or even your Netflix, you know, uh, you are paying for something, you expect something back. You don't expect Netflix, Netflix, for example, out of a sudden to be sharing all your data with an open book to, because it's a paid service. There are some, yeah. Uh, expect that. And that, that's what we as a society need to understand. Maybe for the world to move on, we need paid social media. There are a couple of thoughts this brings to mind. And I think a lot of these are just complex questions with no clear answer. But um, th the implication that we would be able to set up a paid social media uh, platform like Facebook, a paid version of Facebook. I mean, I suspect that wouldn't do very well because a big part of what gets these platforms off the ground is network effects. So, you know, you're on there because your friends are there and they're there because you're there. And the more, more you, you put a barrier between people uh, entering, you greatly diminish the fraction of people who are going to jump on. You greatly diminish the um, the lock-in, essentially, that, that um, uh, network effect. Uh, so platforms that charge nothing up front have this like wild unfair advantage when it comes to especially network effect businesses. And so competing with them is like really hard at this stage, especially. And, and I, so I like that, that's the first piece is like, I wonder if that's feasible, unfortunately. And then the second piece is if it is, do we risk heading towards a world where privacy is no longer assured it's a privilege that only people who can afford to pay for social media can actually afford in other words do we find ourselves having to literally buy our privacy well that's that's all good and fair questions but um, um you know uh, it, it's 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 um, uh, a very uh, uh, non-black and white world yeah. On one hand Right now, you have a lot of people complaining about their privacy, which is correct. And we all want, and then again, I, I, I think about privacy in many fronts. I think we, uh, step one, we need to all ensure all these platforms, these giant platforms, and, and all the companies that have digital, they all need to protect the data. In case there is a hack, the data should be protected at rest. They will get, you know, uh, encrypted forms of data or tokenized forms of data, which, you know, it will take a significant amount of time and effort by very, very specialized people to be able to decrypt it. And that, that, that way, we as a world and as a society are way more protected than we are today. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is providing tools to the different t people to know what their data is used and how. And, and third, we should indeed have an option to have a paid service to avoid your particular data uh, to be shared in a way you don't want, but you can't control in the free service. Now, what does that bring to the society? Would that bring inequality because people that probably are less capable of you know, having um, uh, you know, a set of, of, of money to, to pay for those, would that create some potential disequalities? Well, maybe, maybe no, it could, and we have to evaluate that. But in the same way, 
you have in different countries social programs uh, which you know try to tackle poverty and other things and and, and this you know could be a very long debate which I, I certainly don't want to deep dive because it's a very you know and 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 you know it's a territory that I'm not we thought about but but we can't expect that we will break the revenue model of all the companies that don't sell a product yeah. and captured our data as a result to just you know, because of privacy, everyone, all of those models will be broken because that's just not realistic. And, and, and I think we need to meet in the middle. We need to provide tools. We need to provide options for whoever doesn't continue to enforce that the data is secure in the databases and where that data is stored. Ensure that, for example, machine learning algorithms, instead of be training like uh, the example I give you, they are trained on, uh, you know, segment based data, which then uh, avoids less privacy. Um, I think th there's a lot of things that we can do to kind of meet us somewhere in the middle, continuing to debate these fundamental issues, right? Mm -hmm. We all want to address them. But I don't think anyone wants a, a, a less smart world in the future. I mean, we all want a, a smarter world. I, at least I want a smarter world in the future, but I don't want to compromise on privacy. There's a, a long way to kind of go and do that. Uh, and this topic, you know, is one of them. I often quote this uh, tweet from, I think it was OpenAI's, one of OpenAI's policy people, Amanda Askell. So she was tweeting about AI ethics and how there's this unfortunate trend in the AI community today where people will point to an ethical problem with a given AI system. They'll say, oh, th this system, um, I don't know, categorizes, it classifies this group of people in this way more often than some other group of people. And the moment that that objection is raised, everyone immediately starts to act as if that's a reason not to deploy the system, period, full stop, end of story. And like, that's not a constructive way of looking at anything. I mean, like water is is going to discriminate in some meaningful way between people or groups or whatever. Like like just about anything you can think of has some sort of nominal bias in terms of the way that that um, groups and things interact with it. The the question is how much of that we're willing to put up with, and and opening that debate up and not having like a single metric that we tie ourselves to that we over focus on and develop a fixation around is is so important because we do want to balance out the value of like customized ads, which as we've argued here, there is an argument for and can be a good thing, and um, and customized user experiences and, and so on with yes the very real problems with bias and, and other things. And, and and to be quite honest with you, when you think about about this. On, on, a, on an ad, it brings all this social media. But if you park that conversation for a second, and, and if you park the ethical related to the color of our skin, which has nothing to do with, with the, the, the fundamental problems that we've been discussing. By the way, we want to address them, no question about it. But think about this. Um, when you translate this into what I'm gonna say now, I, I guarantee you people say, well, but in that case, it's okay. So I won't even go to the COVID uh, example because we are all so fed up about that. We just want to move on. But I want to, you know, give me another disease that is global and, the fact, and it's growing, right? And you have five or six hospitals, okay? That have patient data that they went in and they had been detected and et cetera. And that data sits in hospital one, hospital two has never seen it and so on and so forth. And in, in such cases, pairing doctors with data scientists, you may be able to early detect some of these issues, improve uh, the quality of those patients, reduce mortality, detect problems way before, come up with solutions. And there are many examples of you know, very complex deep learning uh, um, algorithms tested that show good accuracy compared to the dog and all that stuff. You know, a lot of these problems are sitting on our desks. No one had looked at it because there is regulations in every country that prevent patient data to be shared. Yeah. Now, I question if we had a grandmother or a mother or a brother or a, or a, or a son or a daughter that is in one of those diseases. And imagine, and hopefully this never happens to me, it's somebody with my skills. I can build machine learning algorithms quickly. And imagine I knew I could be accessing all this data to help. 
and I can't. And imagine the battery of use cases that exist around the world, and, and trust me, they do exist. Just, just they do exist. Billions yeah. and billions of problems to be solved that privacy is actually preventing us from solving them. And, and our entire focus, as you correctly said on that post by Open, OpenAI, is we found a society problem. By the way, one of the companies uses AI and of course, the AI will show the exact society problem and we all point the fingers at AI because we all need to have, a, a, the blaming culture is to blame something for a problem uh, instead of trying to, to address it. But who is solving this hospital's problem? A few, a few people around the world, and I, I don't want to point you know, names, but we have some open source initiatives, we have some uh, startups, we're, we're looking into you know, uh, things like federated learning, multi-party compute, uh, evolvements around homomorphic, uh, synthetic data, you know, many techniques to overcome this, but have you questioned all of these individuals uh, that are complaining about all these other problems that exist about these problems as well? How many, how, like, how many lives are you willing to trade for privacy is a very, uh, very challenging question that I don't think is asked enough in the, in the medical context. And, and we talk about lives because this is the, you know, you're playing low level when you go and say, yep. hey, what about your life? But, but think about something in between. Food wastage, mm -hmm. climate change, poverty. Uh, flip the problem around. Use machine learning to find out people, high potential people in poverty that if you gave them a loan, you would actually bet in somebody's career. What does a venture capital do against a startup? They bet on a, on a, on a, on a, on a, on a project, you know, invert the problem, bet in people. And I think it's much easy to blame and to, you know, not have a, a forward thinking uh, mentality, these problems wouldn't will, will not disappear without AI. You know, if you close all AI systems, all of these problems will exist, including those that are not saving lives, the food wastage, et cetera, all of yeah. that. And, and I think to kind of close up this, this thought is um, we need to move forward and meet in the middle. I think this leads to a really interesting sub discussion about what privacy actually is because all those examples that you gave of the let's say let's call it the plus side of the ledger the things we could stand to gain from if we you know if we let loose on privacy a little bit uh, these are things like loss of life we can measure that very directly these are things like careers created or food waste saved these can be measured roughly in dollar terms there's like pretty you know, relatively easy ways to do this uh, privacy is not something that can be measured as far as I know, or can it? That's like one key question, because to, to me it seems like, you know, if, if you put a, a number of billions of dollars on one hand, and then there's some vague notion of privacy on the other, at least I personally find it difficult to kind of wrangle how I should value those two things. And maybe this is just a question of like a fundamental principle we, we don't want to compromise on to some degree, and, and the benefits of like being loose with it. But do you have any thoughts on like privacy metrics and maybe how, how privacy can be quantified? You know, the fundamental questions about privacy and uh, measuring that is, is an ongoing topic. And, and, and I, I, I wanna throw out there the, the, this. I don't think in 15, 20 years, you will have a definition of how to measure that because the society looks at it also in a different way. I think the easiest mm. uh, meet in the middle path forward is something along the lines of, we create in every digital system um, similar paths as Apple, where basically you are educated in first place with what are the controls you have on your hand to treat more or less uh, your data in a certain way to do a certain thing. So I am seeing, for example, you and I, because I, I catch you also sometimes like to have target, you know, the pages and, and things, and you're okay with, you know, two people searching for the same thing, being shown different things, because, you know, that's based on my preferences. Um, I'm okay with that because I understand how that got put together. 
but some people may not. So I think we need to give them the tools to say, hey, you don't like this. Here is what you can do about it. Define a little bit more of what you can on your privacy. But remember, I cannot um, make um, everything that you potentially want because I have a business to run through those frameworks, which will evolve. I think the first step is up with doing on, on this monitoring and you know some of these other things that we've, we've been discussing with GDPR, anonymization, you know, uh, some other technique. Those will be paths forward so that people like us uh, around the world can say, well, I'm okay with this. I'm less okay with that. Um, and for the institutions, banks and, and everything else, especially the industries that touch you in a more deep way, like your financial institution, your healthcare, they probably need to, in the future, create hybrid decision-making processes with automation, some that are 100% AI, others that are less, so that they address the ethical and the society problems that they have without blaming a machine learning algorithm, right? That's the, the way forward. So that's how I would say risk will start to potentially be measured. Now, putting a quantification against it really would force all of us to buy to that quantification. Yeah, yeah. Well, you you made a really good point as well at the be very beginning of that too, which is just that like the definitions of privacy have been changing over time. The The way we think about you know, going back to 2008 Facebook, when I uploaded my pictures to Facebook, I remember having a very difficult conversation with my parents at the time who were like, whoa, you 17-year-old kid, are you sure you know what you're doing? You're just going to put your life details on the internet? That doesn't seem like a good idea. And people generally thought that, certainly, you know, in the mid-2000s. And yet today, it's like, you know, you go on TikTok or Twitter, you're letting people know what you're having for lunch or whatever. And that's like the norm. Can we expect this to keep happening? And do you, do you see this happening in a particular direction? Yeah, look, just how do you answer this? The activists about privacy are streaming live on Facebook about that particular event. And I'm like, really? Okay, you want to make the world know about, yeah, but you're also, country, you know, you're feeding the, <laughs> the system. Uh, and I, I, you know, sometimes I, I, kind, of, I kind of say, well, okay, well, I, uh, I, I honestly think that uh, we in the schools, right from the early ages, we need to improve the digital education. We need to improve the awareness of what privacy techniques are. We need to in universities and not just on the computer science, on the machine learning, uh, but also on the economic, on the law universities. We need, you know, a lawyer in data privacy. Where did that come from? Like in 2008, did that exist? Right. Right, do we have a degree on privacy being you know, right and, and the other issue is who would who would teach these programs right i mean I, I think about this a lot when it comes to education um unfortunately it is simply a reality that there are strong economic pressures uh enforcing the principle that those who can't do teach Th this is just like very often teachers there, there are some wonderful teachers but very often they are among the people who understand things the least. I, I'm literally speaking from personal experience in my undergrad in physics, where you see the, the kinds of people who move off into this direction, and they're there largely because they don't have a fiery passion for whatever subject matter, they, or they're, they're not interested in continuous learning. And th I know that this is going to be extremely controversial to say, but it's something I see working in ed tech every day of my life. This is the competition, and it's like it's not even fair. Ed tech companies like Khan Academy deliver a better quality product than a lot of public education because of incentives and because of the kinds of people who tend to work there. When it comes to trying to bring people on board and, and you know, teach about privacy, teach about this stuff. I, I wonder, like, I mean, that's obviously it's a really deep societal challenge and it shows up everywhere. But um, do, like, do you see that as being a challenge as well? I, 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 I honestly think that I told you at the beginning awareness and I will use the awareness word. Awareness is uh, uh, a challenge and you overcome awareness with education yeah. at all levels. 
And the, the challenge we have right now is that it's not that just the awareness is not yet in the schools and the universities. It's not even yet in the enterprises. Yeah. Every company should be audited in the same way they are financially with, do you have your data protected? It, does it have, you know, if, if anybody steals your data, can they easily see what's inside? Yeah. Until you, you okay, but what does that mean? And then go over to the business teams and, and, and non-technical people and technical people at the same time and talk and, and make them aware that you have all these capabilities. And by the way, there is this perception on, or at least I'm not sure if you have this perception, but I do because I talk to business, very, very, you know, many business every day that um, data privacy and data security is a bottleneck to drive innovation. It's actually the opposite. You, you actually open the, the data, the access of that data is just protected, but there's a ton that you can and should do with that data protected. And, and, and what, are, what are challenges that you have in organizations is that the result of this fear, because fear is just a very bad culture in an organization, the fear brings silos. I'm not gonna share this thing because, you know, yeah, with yeah. This, right? And, and the data protected overcomes that. The techniques that we've discussed just briefly overcome that. And, and, and in the other hand, you're protected if you get a, you know, a hack, if you get an attack, you're protected. And on the other hand, you're enabling, you're enabling. And, and I think that trade-off uh, because of awareness is not happening. And therefore it should, it should be like the very principle and basic thing everyone does. After that, you know, it's really important. You know, I, I, I came from a place where no one or very little people knew about analytics and then machine learning. We, we, we had, you know, our activities called many different things from early days, data mining and then modeling, you know, predictive and all, all sorts of stuff. And, and that's okay, because this, you know, will evolve and will be called something different in the future and that's fine. But one of the ways to overcome the awareness was we created uh, programs linked to HR about, you know, how to educate yourself about what you can do with this, what you can do that, what is this good for business? We need to create those, rather being through an online platform, through physical uh, education, and then continue that towards universities and, and, uh, and, and schools, uh, you know, uh, early age schools, to equip more people with the passion for this. You know, uh, another, I know you talked about this. I'm seeing a trend. Almost, or you know, the more advanced organizations are starting to build responsible and ethical AI uh, roles. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you know, it took me, and I'm honest, and you know, maybe other people were faster than me. Or they probably are more, you know, clever, or you know, I don't know. But it took me nearly eight years to be able to highlight to HR and other business functions, how I should structure a data and AI team. Right. How do we pair engineers with scientists? How do we evolve their careers for them to become, you know, they, they come from university at the junior level, how they grow to become a director or a chief data. You know, you don't train in school. How do you become a chief data officer? Yeah. It's not that. So I'm struggling to understand how all of these companies out of a sudden have a business function model for an AI ethical function. And, 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 and therefore, I'm not saying they're, they're wrong, okay? I am just saying, because I'm looking at the problem, not just from AI, but from the fundamentals of data, business processes, change, society problems, I still don't know how I should organize that. Yeah. Yeah, there are an awful lot of like a suspicious number of companies that uh, that have these these sorts of initiatives. Um, I remember talking to on the podcast we had uh, Joaquin uh, Quinonero Candela, who is the the responsible AI lead at Facebook, and he was describing just basically how much philosophizing and strategizing and thinking and, and iteration has gone into the formation of their team with all the challenges that we know they faced, you know, like, I mean, they, they're they doing their best, at least this, in, this internal team certainly seems to be, he's, he's thinking about a lot of tough problems and yet, um, and yet they're still facing those challenges. The idea that other companies that have been in the game for, you know, 12 to 18 months, I think it's great that 
almost from a PR standpoint, that this is putting pressure on people to at least start to look at this. That's kind of a win. But uh, yeah, you're right. The next level is we need educated consumers who can actually even tell what efforts are like are worth supporting and which ones are maybe more dubious. Yeah, and, and maybe what needs to happen is some of these more uh, mature organizations. Uh, you know, I, I present a lot of times in conferences, and I, 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 I people may disagree. So you know, I, I, I say there is three levels of data science or AI teams in organizations that are the ones kind of playing around still, and that's eighty percent of the world with POCs, and they do a success story. And, there is, you know, around 15% that are thinking about structure, scale, automation, career paths. And there's like the likes of the Facebooks, the Netflix, there is a small, very small percentage of organizations that, you know, are in, you know, a, a, a very, very, very mature state. They, they, they have thought about that. And I think those organizations should come forward maybe as a group or individually sharing their organization models for uh, privacy, responsible AI, ethical AI, how that is affecting security in their organization so that other people can learn. Because I, I'm quite frank, I think it's great PR wise that we put these initiatives forward. If I, if I was on a, you know, if I was a chief, you know, AI officer, data officer on the organization and the CEO came to me and said, you know, and um, does responsible AI sit under you or under privacy or under security? Right. I couldn't answer that right now. Not yeah. because I would not need to be an involved stakeholder, contributor, influence, strategist, you know, brainstormer, you know, all of those things. But I actually need more time to see how things are evolving to actually understand where is the right place for this to be. Yeah. And it may change from one organization to the next and will change over time. And there's so many. But, but to be honest, if you think through what I was saying before, we are now in a more agreement space, space into how to group engineers and science together. I think a lot of the world understand that engineers and data science need to be paired together. They need to have career paths. They, need, they can work in agile, but not everything in agile apply. So I think we kind of have some guiding principles that some leaders now take. And, you know, we all have DevOps processes in play. All of those things are now way more mature. I think the time will, will, will help us structure these functions equally there. I honestly think that this, the, tri the, first, the triangle of privacy, security, and this cheap data AI kind of, I mean, that is not even oiled enough yeah. to start with. And I think PR wise, you know, would be great if more companies come forward to say, here is how we oil this machine. Yeah, to take a little bit more of a lead. And, and I think it's it's one of these areas too where everything gets muddied by politics as well. Uh, there, there are legitimate political concerns. This stuff overlaps so quickly with, you know, when, when you say fairness, now all of a sudden you're into defining what fairness looks like. You have people who are fans of equality of outcome versus equality of opportunity versus different definitions of, of of equity and and so on. So it, it, it's so difficult to, to have this space be relatively uncontaminated by, by policy and basically to have it focus on philosophy instead, which is really where the, the rubber meets the road here. Um, anyway, yeah, thanks so much for, for sharing your thoughts. This has been a, a we, we've gone like way over time from our, our initial scheduled uh, timing here. So I really appreciate you hanging on for the rest of the chat. Really appreciate uh, all those insights and thanks so much for making the time. Yeah, thank you.